beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now imagine that I'm right, he said mockingly. Suppose the whole faith in God is nonsense. Then you have devoted your life to nothing. Well, not for nothing, replied the other. Faith means a lot to me and in my life here on earth. Yes, but what if it is all a fiction? He laughed mockingly again. The other thought for a moment. But what if I'm right and you are not? Then you've lived a life without God. What then if you must one day appear before his judgment seat? Could be, but there is still the possibility for conversion just before that moment comes, was the response. Think of the criminal on the cross. Easy as that. But beloved, hearing this conversation, is that true? Was this just the criminal's last minute prayer to make sure that he ends up in heaven? Well, let's find out. As on this Good Friday, we're at Golgotha again. And we see three men hanging crucified. A king and two criminals. And in our text, there's not only one prayer, but three. We hear three prayers. One from a rebellious, bitter heart. One from a saved heart. And one from a heart in the evening of his life. So I preach to you the gospel of salvation this morning under the theme, the prayers of three crucified men. First, the blasphemous prayer. Second, the saving prayer. And third, an evening prayer. The prayers of three crucified men. First, the blasphemous prayer. Indeed, the procession following three convicts has arrived on Calvary. Two criminals and the king of the Jews with bystander Simon of Cyrene carrying the latter's cross. Then they were laid down on their bare crosses. But while the soldiers were often insulted by the convicts, they nailed to the cross. Jesus did not curse them. Also not when the soldiers lifted him on the fastened or to the permanent upright pole on Golgotha. And so we see them hanging there with their bruised, bloody and naked bodies in the full morning sun. They appear to have, to all have what they have in common. That's their appearance. Two of them are nameless Convicts, convicted criminals. The other, the famous rabbi whose teaching, preaching, and miracles upset the Jewish religious leadership. There, Jesus of Nazareth is in the center, flanked by a criminal on the left and on the right. And while they groan from the pain and the anguish, Jesus suddenly prays for forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The soldiers, not understanding his Aramaic speech, ignored him, and sat down to gamble for his clothes as that they just stripped from him. There are others there on Golgotha, too, and they together mock Jesus. Some soldiers mock him too. 
the Jewish religious, religious leaders mock him. Others wag their heads and throw insults at him. Even both criminals joined in, disrespecting our Savior, hoping to have some fun with him at the last miserable hours of their life. And initially, as we read in the Gospel of Matthew, both blasphemed and mocked him with the leaders and the people. Full of bitter scorn, they shouted, If you are really the Christ, prove that. Show your power by saving yourself and us from the cross. But then one of them, the one on Jesus' right hand, stopped cursing. And became silent. Yet the one on the other side continued to insult Jesus. Somewhere or somehow aware that Jesus called the Christ, his mocking insults turned to a blasphemous conditional prayer, prayer coercion. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. If you really have the power to redeem. Show it and get us from these crosses. Then I will believe. I think, brothers and sisters, that this prayer of this criminal, if we can call it prayer, this prayer is prevalent. Often people in desperate situations challenge Christ or God. If there's a God, if Jesus is powerful, let him prove it here and now. And so this, this criminal is not, is not desperate for help. His prayer is a faithless, accusing, and blasphemous prayer. It's a bitter, arrogant one, doubting that Jesus could do anything. If you are the Savior, you have to shout now. But our Lord Jesus remains silent. The one who endures in his blasphemous prayer gets no answer. And that is also something we find in our society. People say they believe, or that they are Christians, that they believe and that they pray. But the rest of their lives show no evidence of obedience and submissiveness to God's Word. The Lord is only their genie in a lamp that they pray to when they're in distress or need a quick fix of their problems. The Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 45, clearly shows from Scripture that a prayer which pleases God and is heard by Him must come from a humble heart that believes in the true God, a heart that thoroughly knows its needs and misery. Instead of praying God in his prayers, this criminal next to Jesus robbed him of his glory. And therefore, in Jesus' silence, judgment is spoken on the criminal's blasphemous prayer. And for that matter, on all prayers that are trying to force God to serve mankind's own selfish desires. And then suddenly, the other criminal speaks up. He doesn't start with a prayer, but he starts rebuking his mate and defends the innocence of the rabbi between them. Because as he hanged on the cross, his heart and his mind have been changed. And he vocalizes it to the criminal on the other side of Jesus. He fully realizes that they are about to die. And dying means facing God in His judgment. Can you do it? Are you ready for it? Don't you realize what is lying ahead? Don't you fear God? Yes, the two of them are receiving what they deserve. Their crosses are justice. But this man's cross is a miscarriage of justice. And he, he realized 
that Jesus has done nothing wrong. And he came to the conclusion that Jesus is an innocent man, apparently suffering death for no valid reason. And then he turns from his fellow criminal and speaks directly to Jesus. But this time he speaks differently. No longer insulting words, but a humble plea. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so we hear the second prayer, a prayer of, for salvation. Beloved, the chains in this man is not as obvious as it seems. As crucifixion, crucifixion was, was used for slaves, pirates, and enemies of the state, the Roman state, it is very likely that both men were hardcore resistance fighters, fighters for the ideal of the liberation of the, from the Roman, Roman rule. And their deeds might to a certain extent have been justified by themselves or other Jews, for the sake of God's people. Maybe they felt more like heroes than sinners. But because his heart and his mind had been changed, he came to the conclusion that their acts as, as freedom fighters were in fact sinful. Not they need to, to save the Jewish people from the Romans. This king of the Jews next to him with his heavenly kingdom, he needs to save God's people and him too. They're not from the Romans, but from sin. And so this man does more than confess the innocence of Jesus. He confesses his sins before Christ. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And brothers and sisters, note how he calls Jesus. He says, Lord, in the Greek, curious. This man next to him, completely stripped from all glory and majesty, he calls Lord. And he does this because he now sees himself through this man's eyes. And he sees that he is a, a sinner in desperate need of grace. And he's fully aware that there is nothing that he can do to make himself better or more desirable to Jesus. He's hanging naked and bloody on the cross too. His hands and feet are nailed to the wood. He can't do any good deeds anymore to make up or for change to change his past. He can't make atonement for his own sin. He needs someone. He needs the king of the Jews, this man, Jesus. And so he simply asked Jesus to remember him, to give thought to him. He's asking Christ to remember him for good, to save him. And he asked that when the day of judgment comes, that Christ will give him, will not give him what he deserves. Here on earth, yes, his crime deserved a cross. That was justice. But now he humbly asks Jesus for grace on the last day. Now we can ask, how did it come for him to turn around. Well, it's maybe that he gradually marveled over the first cross word, the word of Jesus on the cross. The only thing he has heard from Jesus' mouth so far is his prayer for the forgiveness for those who struck him on the cross. But beloved, as we know, one word from the word that became flesh, Jesus, is enough to be used by the Spirit to convert, fully turn a hand around. The Holy Spirit turned this criminal into a child of God. And when Jesus dies, He will die for him too. This miraculous, this criminal 
miraculously became your and my brother in Christ. He became our brother through grace by those few words of forgiveness of our Lord. And, and we then, the vast majority of us, knows a lot more than he did. We have received the full word. What do we do with that word? God will not ask us one day what we have known of the word, but what we have done with that word. And so, contrary to the blasphemous prayer from his mate, for a miracle on this side of death, he prays where the miracle may happen at the other side of the grave. Now he asks no more for Christ to get him off the cross, but that the Savior be gracious to him when he comes into the kingdom before the judgment seat of God. This is a beggar, a sinner beggar begging for forgiveness. Intercede for me, Lord. Make my case yours. Remember me in your covenant. Beloved, when, when you listen to this prayer, you might think, well, this is indeed amazing. Because I'm not better than that criminal. My sins often devastate me. Sometimes I even think that I've gone too far to receive forgiveness. And look at this criminal. If anyone has gone far, too, uh, was too far gone, it was him. He has wasted his life, robbed men and God. And he has been mocking Jesus to his face. Yet he dares to ask for mercy from the Savior. Does that mean that I can do likewise? Yes. Yes, beloved. The gospel invites each one of us, all of us, to go to the cross and find grace. No, we should never presume upon God's grace. No one should ever think that this can be put off till the last moment because of what happened with the criminal on the cross. But the good news is that you are all welcome to bow before Jesus to receive redemption. Even your biggest secret sin, the Lord will forgive. He will not allow you to slide further down than the foot of the cross. And this we see in, in the answer Jesus gave on the criminal's prayer. Because then Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And literally Jesus says, Amen. In other words, he's solemnly affirming what he says. This is an ironclad guarantee, an irrevocable promise. There should not be a shred of doubt that what Jesus says will come past. And I tell you the truth. Amen. Today, you will be with me in paradise. What an answer. Amazing. But with this answer, beloved, Jesus gives this repentant criminal far more than he asked for. This criminal asked to be remembered on judgment day. He asked for mercy in the distant future. But Jesus grants mercy today. Today your sins will be forgiven. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will experience my fellowship there. And brothers and sisters, paradise is not... Not the idyllic kind of tropical island promised on a travel agency's brochure. Paradise was originally a, a special garden, also called the Garden of Eden, where a perfect fellowship 
between God and man existed. But since the fall, an angel with a flaming sword was guarding the entrance to paradise. Every human being is denied access to God's heavenly throne except through Christ. Paradise is the reality awaiting us on the new earth, says Revelation 2 verse 7. The new creation where there will be perfect fellowship between God and man. You, criminal, you will be with me. You will be in that fellowship with God and me today. That's what Jesus promised the criminal on the cross. On that very day, his soul will be with Jesus in heaven in the presence of the Father Almighty. And when Jesus' soul will return to the earth after three days, the converted criminal soul will remain in heaven. And later he will see Jesus with the same body that was on the cross next to him, returning in glory and standing on the right hand of the Father. What a promise. What Jesus promised to the criminal will instantaneously also happen with us when we die, beloved. One moment, your soul will be here on this earth, and the next, you'll be in heaven. What a comforting thought we receive in this part of Scripture. And because we love Christ, we can't imagine that heaven could be desirable apart from Jesus, to consciously enjoy fellowship with Him until He returns for judgment. Who would not want that? For us, there's no greater things to desire, because here on earth, our relationship with Christ goes through ups and downs and peaks and valleys. And He does that not because of Him, He's always faithful, but because of us, because of our sins. But in heaven, there will be no more ups and downs. There will be perfect, unfettered communion with our Savior. Our text holds out this promise, this gospel promise to us this morning on this Good Friday. Let us all cling to this promise. And beloved, one last aspect I want to highlight in this point is the amazing character of the faith, the Spirit work in this criminal. Because we should not forget that Satan was immediately aware of this new convert. So this man's faith was immediately attacked, challenged, and tested. Because after Jesus' prayer, answered on his prayer, nothing really changed in the outer circumstances. The criminal was not then immediately taken to heaven. He would have been on that cross for uh, quite a few hours. And, and no one is there around to encourage him to stay with the Word of God, to remain in the faith that we experience in this communion of saints. And, and let's not forget that not long after Jesus' graceful answer, it became dark around them. He, he couldn't see Jesus anymore. All he hears is Jesus screaming, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The one that promised him access to paradise now wrestles with the eclipse of God, God, the hiding of God in the most profound sense of the word one who promised him paradise and promised to remember him now struggling in the desolation. Could this be true? And then the hardest part follows. Jesus dies. Is this then the end? So through all, out all those hours from Jesus' answer until his own death, this criminal was attacked. And he had nothing else to hold on only to that one answer of Jesus. 
But beloved, when the Spirit of Christ works in a man, then that is believing against all odds. To believe, to trust God on His Word in times of difficulty is sometimes very difficult, yes. Yet through the power of the Spirit, He could hold on to Jesus. Amen. And it's the only thing we can and should hold on to when there is darkness around us. God's Word. Even if it feels that God is absent in that darkness. When everything we experience seems to be opposite of all God's promises. Moments when we need to let go, for example, when dementia or Parkinson's kicks in. Or maybe that moment you're laying in your deathbed and you have to let go and anxiety paralyzes your hearts. Then never forget the amen, the amen spoken to this criminal on his prayer. The Lord will not let us go from his hand. He promises, his promises never cease. What a blessed man he was indeed. How blessed are we indeed. And so we come to the third crucified man's prayer. But before we do that, let us sing together. Hymn 24, verse 5 and 6, reflecting on what we have heard in this man's prayer. Hymn 24, verse 5 and 6. evening prayer. That's our third point. Because brothers and sisters, shortly before his death, Jesus takes as his last words a prayer on the lips. And it's a moving testimony of faith and expectations. And the prayer begins with the title, Father, Abba, expressing an intense intimacy and total trust. And if there's one who knows this intimacy, it is Jesus. For he is the Son. This was clear already from a very early stage of his life. As 12 year old boy, as 12 year old boy, he said, Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? And he has never been. And this has never been out of his life. And therefore, Jesus, Jesus finally addresses his father. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
And that is that service is written all over his body. And we hear our Savior quoting Psalm 31 verse 5a. But you know, these words were spoken by parents and children in Israel in those days at the fall of night when the trumpets from the temple in the ninth hour call for the evening prayer then parents and children pray to before nightfall Lord into your hands we commit or I commit my spirit that means my breath my life everything that makes me exist I completely entrust to you Lord your hands keep my life safe as I enter the night and now our Lord Jesus prays the same evening prayer. In those hands which receive and protect, Jesus gives his spirit. He gives himself. He gives his own life. Because his death is not a fate, but a self-conscious act. Despite the three hours of hell, indeed, as a child, he remained the son of the Father. And Jesus calls this, brothers and sisters, this word with a loud voice, says, look. And this is such, it's amazing, it's wonderful. Because who has the strength in the last seconds of his life on earth to clearly, audibly speak out to raise his voice? How much more must it have been for Jesus after such severe suffering? Yet he did it as fully man. And fully God. And with a loud and clear voice, he quotes God's word from Psalm 31. Because that is what the author of Psalm 31, David, has endured. A miserable journey through life. Hunted by enemies. Mocked by his neighbors. Feeling utterly lonely and forsaken by God. And now Jesus says, I fulfill this psalm. Because I've experienced this completely. Not only during, during my life but also here in the evening of my life at my death. Only he could fully and rightly lay his life in Father's hands because his life was perfect, completely obedient, completely and perfectly fulfilling God's will for us. And therefore Luke mentions it so, so loudly pronounced so that you and I can hear, so to speak, that sound still today for in his spirit Christ takes all those along in that prayer those who belong to him in this prayer it's not just about himself but he entrusts entrust all whom belong to him into the father's hand and who are all those those people are it those, that, those who refuse to live without their Lord? Those who fully put their trust in His work? Those who, in the midst of their lives, fully entrust themselves to His love every hour of the day? Are it those parents and children who kneel for their evening prayer every night? And also those who fold their hands in the last hour of their lives. Time has come for me to sleep. And I thank thee for thy keep. Watch this night well over me. Teach me, Lord, to trust in thee. And that means, beloved, with Jesus we can sleep in without worries also on our last day. Arriving in the heavenly hands in, in paradise, at home with the Father and the Son in heaven. Because Jesus prayed this evening prayer for himself and for us. And nothing can separate us from his love. This you and I, brothers and sisters, can confess. As a child, no matter how old we are, this should bring praises to our mouth, praises to God that leaves us with the love for our gracious Savior. 
For his grace for us is sufficient and his blood enough to wash away all our sins. And we can be sure that together with the converted criminal, we will one day enjoy eternal fellowship with Christ. Brothers and sisters, that's the promise to treasure. Not only on this Friday, Easter Friday, 2015, but every day of our lives. It is never too late. Amen.